Okay, so we're just seeing a few more people sign on. And while they're signing on, um, I'm going to just take a quick, um, uh, quick um, review of the agenda. So we're now noon at Eastern time. Um, we're going to do just some quick introductions. I'm not going to go through everyone's bios because they're all in the um, on the online platform. Um, but I did want to introduce um, the order in which we're going to go. Um, we have our first presenter is Steve Fronick, a 40 plus year veteran of the fenestration industry, uh, vice president um, at Warsaw Window and Wall Systems. He's going to be talking about um, specification of fenestration energy performance. Um, we're, he's going to be talking for about 25 minutes um, and then there'll be about 10 minutes for questions. Then um, I will um, talk for about 10 minutes on taking a dive into the edge of fenestration. Um, my name is Helen Sanders from Technoform. After me, I'm, we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna hand it off to Stefan Hoffman. Stefan um, is Vice President at Thornton, Tom, uh, uh, sorry, at uh, Morrison Hirschfield. Um, he is an expert in thermal bridging and he's gonna be taking us through um, how to analyze thermal bridging um, on the envelope. And then he's gonna hand over to Alejandra Menchaca. Um, Alejandra is Vice President at Thornton Tomasetti, and she's going to be giving us a um, deep dive into assessing thermal comfort next to the facade and giving us a tour of a uh, online free thermal comfort tool that we can uh, use in the design process. Um, that should take us up to two o'clock. We have probably five or ten minutes after that if people want to hang around and, and ask questions. Um, but with that, I just want to talk a little bit about the um, logistics of using the platform. Everyone um, has a Zoom window open. They also have the Pathable platform, which was the Facade Tectonics Conference platform that they um, entered Zoom through. Um, we're going to be doing some polling using that platform. Um, and so when it comes to polling or when it comes to, if you want to uh, ask some questions during um, the uh, presentations, you can do so through the chat box on the Pathable platform. So the polling and the, um, uh, and any, uh, any chat and messaging should be done through the Pathable platform. If anyone has any questions about that, let me know. This is a Zoom meeting, so everybody can talk. Um, but just for sound quality, I would recommend anyone who's not talking um, mute themselves. Um, and so if you want to ask a question um, during, the, during any of the presentations, um, either use the chat box or wait until we get to the Q&A session. So there'll be at least 10 minutes of Q&A after every, every section. Does anyone have any questions before we get started? Okay, so I'm going to hand it over to uh, Steve if you want to take control. Hopefully it's not another six hour game. We have liftoff. <laughs> Once again, please uh, mute your phone. Uh, until you'd like to join the meeting. Um, as Helen mentioned, I'm Steve Fronick from Wausau Window and Wall Systems. I've been here at Wausau uh, for over 40 years uh, and have been active in both AMA and NFRC, our industry's standards development organizations. This is not looking promising, is it? You're on the last slide, Steve. You just need to go to the top of the presentation. Oh, you get a sneak preview. Hey, great. I'm here to cover the basics of specifying energy performance for fenestration. And more importantly, uh, to address the applicability, variability, and limitations of these parameters that are so commonly cited in specifications. Um, other smarter 
workshop presenters um, will offer more detail and analysis. So uh, you can expect my presentation to be pretty basic. Uh, Wausau Windows is an architectural framing systems business unit of Apogee Enterprises. Um, Apogee is the parent company of a number of well-respected brands in our industry. Um, Viracon internationally, Wausau Fco Harman, Tubalite and Line Tech in the U.S., and Alumacor and Sodawall in Canada. Uh, Apogee also uh, offers commercial building owners energy modeling and other services to assess window replacement and recladding through their Apogee Renovation Group. Um, First, let's review the basics of fenestration energy performance. Hopefully this will set a baseline and a common understanding for the other presentations in our workshop. <clears throat> All energy parameters associated with exterior walls are determined assuming steady state conditions. Of course, building envelopes are subject to transient conditions and respond over time based on their thermal mass and their permeability to air, water, moisture. Uh, so when we review these parameters, you have to keep in mind in interpreting them that they're determined under steady state conditions and that may affect their applicability to certain situations when it's transient phenomenon that make the difference. The most basic of energy parameters is the U factor or thermal transmittance. And in the case of windows and curtain wall, uh, U factor is an area weighted average of the frame and the edge of glass uh, and the center of glass performance. Uh, U factor is determined through guarded hot box testing or, or finite element modeling. Uh, heat flows from warm to cold but energy also flows um, through radiation and solar heat gain coefficient is a measure of the percentage of total, total solar heat gain that's transmitted by a fenestration system. And that's ultraviolet, visible light, and infrared taken together, uh, measured at normal incidence. In other words, with the glass, uh, at 90 degrees to the incident solar radiation. When you get to extreme off angles, as you're well aware, uh, the solar optical properties of glass change that is not captured in solar heat gain coefficient. In fact, for certain kinds of coatings that set up an interference effect, even the color of glass can change with off angle incidence or reflection. Make sure to specify basis of your building permit in your project specification. Uh, over 80% of commercial buildings um, use one of the performance compliance pads, either uh, COMFEN or trade -off, component trade-offs or whole building energy modeling. It's vital that everyone involved with the project, especially the fenestration manufacturer and subcontractor, uh, know the numbers that were permitted and that gives us the targets we need uh, to meet your energy goals. Um, visible light transmittance or VT is also a frequently specified parameter, though not particularly impactful on either code or lead. Um, but one thing that is impactful to building performance is resistance to the formation of condensation. Uh, some sort of condensation requirement is almost always included in project specifications in cold climates, either by one of the four standard rating systems, CRF, CR, CI, or TI, or in critical applications like hospitals and condos and laboratory buildings, uh, by applying basic heat transfer and psychrometry principles to um, predict surface temperatures and check against dew point. Uh, air leakage, it's most significant in renovation projects where existing windows 
um, may be allowing a lot of air infiltration or a lot of exfiltration. And by swapping them out with new airtight windows, you can significantly change uh, both the energy performance of the building and the interior conditions, and sometimes not for the good. Uh, of course, aesthetics are important, as is a balanced view of all the design criteria associated with fenestration. Don't get hung up on a single number rating system. I always advise uh, people doing product selection to uh, trust the system features more than standard ratings. For example, what is the thermal barrier separation distance? Um, what is the conductivity of the insulating glass unit spacer? Uh, what gas fills are being used? And what is the emissivity of the uh, coatings? Are the coatings spectrally selective? Um, those features will inform uh, a lot better analysis than just uh, NFRC 100 rating. Uh, it's also good design practice uh, to look for those thermal bridges, keep your isotherms and weather seal lines coplanar to the extent possible, and uh, other speakers in the workshop will be getting into a lot more detail in that more uh, involved uh, design. Let's talk about uh, standard industry energy ratings, uh, both what they are and their applicability and their variability and their inherent limitations. Um, the core issue is uh, what's representative of my project. Uh, NFRC standard sizes are not representative of any project. However, they're a basis for a fair comparison, a level playing field when you're in product selection mode. Uh, all of our Wausau published U factors are based on NFRC 100 size configuration and program rules. Why we want to eliminate job specific variables and avoid misleading claims. So if you see something published by WASA, it's an NFRC 100 standard rating. Project specific configurations have a really significant impact on U factor solar heat gain and condensation. I show one example here. Uh, between a vision area that's one five by eight light versus six five by eight lights. And as you can tell, it has a 30% difference in the U factor. Uh, U factor and solar heat gain and condensation are all determined uh, through finite element sim uh, analysis or, or simulation. Um, however, only the two dimensional finite element tools have been validated through testing. Uh, for use in those AMA and NFRC ratings. Testing is subject to many of the same repeatability and reproducibility issues as finite element modeling. And test results should be interpreted accordingly. Uh, as I note on the right-hand side of the slide here, uh, these product energy parameters, especially U-factor and solar heat gain, are used for sizing the mechanical equipment. They're used for selecting products and comparing products. They're used to estimate use phase energy consumption. They're used to verify code compliance. And those standard NFRC 100 ratings are most useful only for product comparison. And uh, you have to um, beware of using those standard ratings for other purposes. Bear with me a second. I may not have my video on here. Can you see my video? Yeah, we can see it. Oh, okay.
I wanted to take a few minutes and review the new NFRC commercial rating program. Uh, NFRC's residential certified products directory, a searchable database of all fenestration products and all options, and the labels that are placed on ship products for residential windows uh, has been widely adopted and it serves as the basis for Energy Star. And of course, EPA's Energy Star is one of the strongest brand names in the window business. Um, a new simplified linear energy analysis for fenestration approach called LEAF was introduced this year. It's, it's similar to the AMA 507 trendline approach, if any of you are familiar with that. But I think that will further strengthen and reinforce the brand equity that NFRC labels have in the residential construction business. Um, however, on the other hand, uh, the component modeling approach, NFRC's commercial program for many years, uh, enjoys a very small market share. Uh, because of this small market share back 2016, uh, the NFRC board launched a strategic initiative uh, headed up by April Rawson and Steve Urich um, to develop a better commercial program for NFRC. And the result of that work uh, is uh, two compliance methodologies. One is called the product directory path based on a commercial trend line approach, very similar to AMA 507 or to LEAF for uh, pre-qualifying standard products on typical projects. So think of it as pre-certification of products before they're applied to a specific job. The other path is the project upload path in which job specific thermal calculations on configurations representative of a specific project are prepared uh, by a certified simulator, a professional engineer, the basic idea is let's certify the simulator rather than certify the product. Uh, because of Wausau's place in the market, we will primarily use this project upload path on our more custom complex larger projects, but that's not true across the board. I'm sure the product directory path will be popular as well. Uh, these new NFRC commercial programs um, address some unmet stakeholder needs for flexibility and speed, credibility and practicality, and for accuracy. And I'm not going to go through this slide in detail, but suffice it to say that April and Steve did a fantastic job in crafting two programs that met these needs for a broad range of projects. The new NFRC commercial programs uh, have the endorsement of commercial manufacturers like Wausau, code officials, um, test labs, uh, and so forth, because it addresses those unmet needs of the stakeholders. And we're looking forward to broad adoption of the new NFRC commercial program, far outstripping what CMA was able to achieve. So that's kind of an update on NFRC's new commercial program. Um, Finally, uh, any rating system, standard rating system, uh, has, uh, we, we've talked about the variability inherent in those systems for U-factor and solar heat gain and visible light and condensation. I wanna look at the real world impact of that variability. In other words, if a U-factor can vary by 10%, what does that mean on a real building? If you'd like to play along at home, uh, or if you would like to run these same scenarios for your project in your city, uh, wausauwindow.com has an energy modeling tool written by Kerry Hagelin from the uh, Efficient Windows Collaborative uh, using TomFen, the Lawrence Berkeley Lab software tool to compare and rank glazing and framing options. So here's the path that you can go in the interest of time, I'm not gonna wait for everybody to log in, uh, but present some results. Let's talk about U-factor first. For most systems, 
uh, NFRC validation limits for U factor modeled versus tested is 0 0.03 plus or minus 0 0.03. That validation limit, if it's plus 0 0.03, has a very marginal impact on energy cost, on peak load, on greenhouse gas emissions, uh, even for a relatively large project in cold climates. I gave two examples here, Seattle and Chicago. Uh, so when you look at uh, U factors of two products and one is 0.4 and one is 0.37, how significant is that difference? not very significant is the answer. So interpret differences in ratings and test results accordingly. Solar heat gain coefficient tells a different story. Let's look at the two most popular uh, low E coatings, double silver and triple silver on clear for that same building in Seattle and Chicago. Uh, note that the impact is two or three times greater than the difference in U factor at the NFRC validation limit. Uh, this is just an indication that even in cold climates, commercial buildings are typically cooling mode dominated. When approaching net zero performance in a well-designed building, uh, U factors importance gets promoted. As it says at the bottom, uh, when striving for net zero, first reduce loads, then incorporate better HVAC, and finally optimize renewables. So for a typical building, that difference in U factor, not very impactful. For a near net zero building, can be a significant portion of the total load. Let's do the same thing with visible light transmittance. Um, as shown in this photo, um, single clear glass, quarter inch clear glass uh, was placed next to a low E insulating glass unit wall. Uh, even this relatively large difference in VLT, 25%, has a relatively minor impact on appearance from the interior. I am consistently puzzled when I see project specifications calling for relatively dark low E coatings on low iron glass. Um, Helen knew I wouldn't let this speech go by uh, without making that comment. Uh, to me, the benefit of low iron glass is being lost. Uh, but what do I know about fashion and style, apparently? Uh, let's do the same thing with condensation. AMA standards for both finite element modeling and testing indicate that about a five degree Fahrenheit variability in predicted local surface temperature can be expected. Uh, this affects the relative humidity at which condensation first starts to form by only about 7% relative humidity. And that's 7% is an aggressive control goal for an HVAC system, given the variables of occupancy and window coverings and makeup air mechanics and everything else that goes into maintaining a relative humidity at the window surface. Um, so uh, it might seem like while uh, uh, predicting surface temperatures to within five degrees uh, is not very accurate, but what this slide indicates is that's accurate enough. In the past year, AMA has published two new condensation standards, AMA 515 for finite element modeling and AMA 501.9 for condensation assessment on full-size mock-ups. Uh, NFRC will roll out its new condensation index rating uh, very shortly here as soon as LEAF is approved, uh, replacing the CR or condensation resistance metric that was again very valuable for comparing one product to another but not very accurate in predicting real world performance and it was seldom specified. So we have a new suite 
of rating tools and assessment methodologies that we'll be able to utilize in the future. And of course, these are all um, simplified procedures. There's no computational fluid dynamics involved here. There's no transient analysis. These are all based on that steady state assumption. Uh, to tie up my part of the presentation in summary, um, make sure the U-factor and solar heat gain coefficient in your project specifications reflect the numbers that were permitted. I strongly encourage that uh, those U-factor and solar heat gain numbers are, are calculated on representative size and configuration. What are the numbers on my job? And then make sure your window and curtain wall specifications are coordinated with your glass glazing spec. Too often times uh, we see a glass specified that is not capable of meeting the U-factors and solar heat gains in the framing spec. For condensation in your specification, if you're in a non-critical application, a hot, uh, office or a school, um, use one of the four single number rating systems. Uh, those will be just fine might allow some condensation on a very cold winter night, but in general, you'd be happy with performance since relative humidity is low. However, if you're in a critical application, like a hospital or a condominium or a laboratory, uh, go back to basic principles. Uh, do the heat transfer modeling. Um, look on your psychometric chart to see what your dew point is perhaps uh, do some exploratory work to estimate the conditions near the wall, because the conditions near the wall aren't always the same as the conditions in the building core where the supplier is coming from, especially in condo occupancies where the only makeup air is what comes under the front door. And then finally, compliance verification. Um, I strongly recommend that you use finite element modeling as the way you verify compliance with specification and code. Why? Because by the time we get to a mock-up, it's too late to change. Uh, condensation, unlike air infiltration or, or water penetration or even structural performance, there isn't much you can do at the mock-up stage to improve condensation. And recognize that the testing, the mock-ups, uh, have the same accurate li accuracy limitations and impact uh, as the finite elements. So put your conservatism in your design conditions. If you're worried about that five degrees Fahrenheit, specify a design temperature that's five degrees colder than you expect for that location and rely on your finite element modeling to prove or validate compliance with the specification. By the time uh, we get to that point, the Standard AMA and NFRC ratings are kind of out the window. Um, products have been selected. We're trying to look at what's right for my project. Uh, that's it for mine. I will, uh, thanks for your attention. I'll turn it back over to uh, Helen and field any questions. Um, what does it mean for the architect to have this new NFRC commercial modeling approach? Um, the architect has the choice of a product rating uh, based on standard NFRC size and configuration um, that can be done ahead of time by the manufacturer and then just applied to the job, or if his compliance mechanism is whole building energy modeling, he can get the correct numbers for his job, for the size, configuration, uh, and the exact conditions, including trim and accessories and uh, installation and substrates for his job. So it gives a tremendous amount of uh, flexibility in the degree of accuracy associated with uh, those energy numbers, the U factor and solar heat gain. Uh, we'll let the, uh, let the punishment fit the crime. If, if you're designing a, a fast food restaurant uh, and the doors are open 100, 100 times a day, um, you really don't care that much if the U factor is plus or minus 0.1. However, if you're in a hospital where your relative humidity is being kept at 50%, you care a lot what those exact numbers are for your project 
on your sizes uh, with your configuration. The new NFRC program allows you to pick which one is appropriate for your job and to specify what you deem representative of the whole project. And from your perspective, is it easier to use? One of the things that we found, oh, we've, we've seen with CMA is it's not well, it hasn't been well adopted because it was harder to use, it was more expensive. Uh, both the um, NFRC residential program and the commercial uh, product path will be enhanced through the use of trend line analysis. So not only is the commercial program gonna be simpler but the residential program will be simpler as well. So benefits on both sides of the aisle, so to speak. Can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, so there's been a lot of, hi Steve. Um, hi, lots Steve. of discussion these days about nat natural ventilation and air movement in buildings driven in part by COVID, but also because of comfort issues as well. Um, any, can you give us any thoughts about trends that you see in the in the window and facade business in terms of making windows operable and in the classic issue of, of, you know, do you allow people to open them or automate them? And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a whole set of issues around it. There's been a lot of talk and discussion about it lately. Any thoughts about that topic generally? Great question, Stephen. Uh, first of all, uh, NFRC developed a natural ventilation rating protocol to make sure that we are all speaking the same language when we talk about uh, airflow through windows. They've opted not to implement it on the label, on the NFRC label, but they did write the technical standards so that if you get a ventilation area rating from one manufacturer versus another, you can assure it was done the same way. I think it's NFRC 700 or 702. That was Ray Garris's task group did a, did a great job. Um, AMA is working on a test method for when operable windows are used in high-rise building. Uh, unfortunately, on occasion, people leave their windows open or unlocked and when a thunderstorm's moving through, and that creates a hazard for passers-by below. And AMA's been working very hard on coming up with a test method that's appropriate for um, operable windows in, in high-rise buildings. So more of a, of a life safety thing. Um, there's certainly a trend toward um, motorized hardware. Uh, typically the hardware is purchased directly by the owner so that the owner has the benefit of the uh, warranty to the original purchaser. Uh, the involvement of us window manufacturers is usually limited to machining those vents uh, to accept the motorized hardware. Um, I am a big supporter of natural ventilation in buildings. You wouldn't dream of building a home that didn't have windows that wouldn't open. Why do we apply different standards to condos and hotels and, and office buildings? Um, the ASHRAE 62.1 standard, um, I think needs some work to get it up to current best practices thinking about occupant control of their environment. Uh, ASHRAE 62.1 just basically says if you put operable windows in a building, don't put them above the dumpster uh, and, and make sure that when you open the window, uh, you don't get the LA smog coming in through it. Uh, so I, I, it's incumbent on our industry uh, to get more involved uh, in the next edition of ASHRAE 62.1. And, and thanks for that question, Stephen. It was a great chance for me to tout operable windows in all kinds of buildings. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, then we're going to move on just to make sure that you, we keep on time here. And I'm going to take a little deeper dive into some of the aspects of fenestration that um, basically Steve just teed up for, um, for me. And for those of you who um, we're a little late joining us. Um, my name is Helen Sanders. Um, I work for Technoform North America. Uh, basically, we focus on making um, windows uh, better in terms of thermal performance, um, thermal breaks, warm edge spacer. So what I want to do is just um, touch again on what um, 
uh, Steve said that the U factor of a window, a window assembly, whether it's a curtain wall, um, uh, a window or a storefront is an area weighted average of the U factor of the center of glass, the U factor of the frame and the U factor of the edge of glass. Um, and weighted by the individual area. So the bigger the window, the more weighting that the glass has, the smaller the window, the higher the weighting the edge has just because of the edge to um, center uh, area ratio. The thing about um, hole fenestration is it's the, the U factor of the entire assembly is what's important. You can spend a lot of time making the center of glass U factor really great. Like you could put triple, um, put, in, put in a triple pane glazing into a window. But if you haven't insulating, insulated the edge, either the edge of glass or the frame, then all the heat's just gonna go around the outside. Heat is like water. It's gonna find the path of least resistance. So it's really important to not just focus on the center, but also to focus on the edges as well. And, and I'm gonna show you some data now that's gonna illustrate that if you take care of the edge in terms of its thermal performance, then you have much better flexibility on what you do with the center. And uh, when you do make the center um, uh, highly insulating, it has much more impact on the overall assembly um, U factor. So here, for example, um, is the U factor of um, a fenestration assembly that has a non-thermally broken frame. So that means basically there is no break between the outside aluminum and the inside aluminum. So heat can go straight through unhindered. So it has non-thermally broken frame. The insulating glass unit has an aluminum spacer, which again means that the heat just goes straight through um, the edge of glass. And it has a center of glass package that has a U factor of 0.29. Now 0.29 is basically a dual pane unit with a double silver low E and air fill. So just a very typical um, insulating glass unit. Nothing, um, nothing out of the ordinary. The U factor is 0.53. Now if I leave the um, frame non-thermally broken and I leave the uh, very conductive spacer in the insulating glass there but I improve the U factor of the center of glass by adding argon, improving the coating, putting a triple silver low E in there. So my center of glass is 0.24. I only improve my assembly U factor by about 6% down to 0.50. However, if I go back to the original center of glass U factor, the double silver low E with air filled dual pane unit. If I thermally break the frame and I put a warm edge spacer in to reduce the conduction at the edge of the glass, I actually get a much better overall assembly value, way better than just changing the center of glass. Now, if I change the center of glass to that lower 0.24 value, add the argon, improve from a double silver to a triple silver low E, um, I end up with a U factor that's now even better and is a 12% reduction over the 0.34 uh, baseline. So when I improve the edge first, when I go to improve the center, the improvements of the center make much more uh, higher proportional difference on the overall assembly U factor. So the lesson here, the message here is um, start at the edge first and then address the center. Now, the other thing that, that Steve talked about was condensation resistance, really important, and U factor doesn't correlate with condensation resistance. So you can't just specify U factor and assume condensation resistance will be good. Um, you have to, they are driven by different mechanisms. Um, the U factor is that area weighted average of the U factor of those three components. Um, the condensation performance is generally driven by thermal bridging at the edge of the window through the frame and at the edge of glass. That's why you always see um, condensation around the edge. And I'm gonna illustrate this um, by looking at the condensation resistance. This is the NFRC value that, um, uh, that Steve talked about. I'm gonna look at those, um, the, the um, condensation resistance for 
four different um, window systems, those same systems we talked about in the last slide. So that non-thermally broken frame with the aluminum spacer and the center of glass of 0.29 um, has a condensation resistance of 16. I put 16.2, but the, the 0.2 is, is really irrelevant um, given the precision. But this is for illustration, because if I change the center of glass and I leave the frame in the edge the same, I basically don't change the condensation resistance. It's still pretty poor. Now, if I go back to the original center of glass at 0.29 and I improve the frame by making it thermally broken, and I put a warm edge spacer at the edge of the glass, I can really improve that condensation resistance. Then if I improve the, um, uh, the thermal break to a best in glass, therm glass thermal break, much wider, for example, I can get to even higher values of condensation resistance. So again, the message here is that the center of glass for the most part has very little impact on condensation resistance. And so if you really wanna have a balanced design of fenestration from a both U-factor and condensation resistance perspective, you really need to manage the thermal performance of the edge first. So just moving on to um, uh, dive into the insulating glass um, and the edge of insulating glass. Um, typically a dual pane unit where two pieces of glass are separated by a spacer and sealants, typically in commercial applications, two sealants, a primary seal, um, uh, which is the moisture, vapor, and gas barrier, um, backed by a secondary seal, which is the structural um, seal that keeps the, uh, the glass together and adhere to the spacer. The insulating glass spacer has a number of essential functions. So before we even start talking about its thermal performance, we have to talk about the, the uh, performance relative to the durability of the unit. First and foremost, it carries desiccant. And desiccant is really important because it's there to keep the, um, keep the cavity dry and stop condensation happening. Now that desiccant not only dries the unit out when it's first made, but moisture vapor is always going into that unit, hopefully at a small rate, but that desiccant is constantly absorbing that moisture that goes into the unit. Um, it's also there to create a moisture barrier and a gas barrier, because if you put gas in your unit and inert gas for thermal performance, you want it to stay in there. It also needs to provide a good surface for sealant adhesion. So if um, that's really important because if you don't have good sealant adhesion to the back of the spacer, moisture can get in through um, the, the secondary sealant um, form um, liquid water and um, start, and that liquid water can start attacking the primary seal and that primary seal does not like liquid water and then you degrade the primary seal and then you have a seal failure. So it's really important to have good seal and adhesion to the back of the spacer. Again, also when you have flexible spacer systems, if you don't have good adhesion to the back of the spacer, um, you can actually start to see spacer walking into the, the vision area. So again, uh, really important um, to have good sealant adhesion. And uh, the benchmark really for um, sealant adhesion and also for desiccant capacity are the box spacers, the metal box spacers um, that have great silicone to metal sealant adhesion. They have zero moisture penet uh, penetration and they have a large cavity to fill with desiccant. So once you've, once you've dealt with the durability aspects, then you can talk about creating a insulating barrier. Um, and what I wanna talk about now is some typical spaces that you see in insulating glass units. The um, historically typical spacer has been the aluminum box spacer that you see down here on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, very highly conductive, but benchmark durability because of the solid metal back, the great sealant adhesion, and the good de desiccant capacity. Um, it has over time been replaced um, to create a uh, lower conductivity system by stainless steel. Um, again, good benchmark durability. Um, if you want to increase thermal performance even, even more, you can have that same 
uh, box based a profile that contains a lot of um, a high quantity of desiccant. Um, but in this case, uh, uh, you can have a, a hybrid, a plastic hybrid stainless steel spacer where there is still metal around the sides where the, uh, and the back where the sealant is adhering, um, but it's bridged with plastic across the top to allow for a thermal break um, in the edge seal. So this, is, um, this has the benchmark durability of the aluminum and the stainless steel spacer because of the solid st um, stainless steel back, but it has thermal performance of 100% non-metal spacers. And a, and a non-metal spacer, which is often seen in residential, but there is one type that's used in commercial applications, is a foam. And in a foam spacer, the desiccant is impregnated into the foam, in, into the foam itself. And on the back is a metallized plastic um, foil, which acts as the moisture vapor barrier. Um, and so what, um, what I want to show you is actually the thermal performance in, a, uh, in actually a window system of these systems. So this is a graph of the U-factor of um, a thermally broken curtain wall with four different types of um, insulating spacer. Um, the aluminum spacer has a U factor of 0.33. If you change it to stainless steel, it drops it by about 0.01, very small amount. If you replace it by one of the hybrid spacers or a foam spacer, you basically get the same result and a significant reduction over the um, aluminum system. Beware when you're doing calculations that the, the bite of the insulating glass unit in the frame and also how much sealant you use has an impact on the, uh, on the U factor. And so make sure you're comparing apples to apples. Um, before I close up here, I want to just show you one more thing. Um, this is actually um, the impact of the edge of glass thermal performance in a structurally glazed applications. Typically, you can expect an improvement of 0.03 to 0.02 um, in U factor when going from aluminum to um, a high performance wall edge spacer in a captured fenestration system. However, when you're talking about a, a four sided structurally glazed curtain wall, you can expect up to a 0.05 uh, difference in U factor, an improvement of around 14% in this example. And that's because there's no exterior frame member in the structurally glazed silicone system and the spacer is the only thing stopping the conduction of heat into and out of the building. So warm edge spacer becomes much more important in structurally glazed systems. Um, here I want to talk about condensation. Again, this is an example of the same fenestration system I showed before, but the condensation rating uh, for four different spacer systems. Um, you can see that stainless steel improves um, the condensation resistance a little over aluminum, but the foam and the hybrid spacer uh, provide the same result and um, significant improvement. And as I close up here, um, I want to just quickly give you um, a sense of what you need to specify in order to reach um, the U factors in the current energy codes. So if you, and, and of course, a lot of you are designing buildings that are not um, using the prescriptive path, they're using the performance path, but you still have target U factors that you need to achieve. So um, this should be still useful for you. So if you want to achieve a, a U factor of 0.38, you have to use a thermally broken frame, generally a dual pane unit with one low E coating, and then you pick one of the four options I've laid out below. A high performance thermal break, a warm edge spacer, you can fill it with argon, or you can put a second low E coating on the room side. Typically you have to be careful when you do that because that lowers the temperature of that surface, which is causes an increased risk of condensation. So um, always, a, uh, uh, always be aware of that. I typically prefer the higher performance thermal break and the warm edge space system because it also improves the condensation resistance as well. If you want to get to a 0.36, same, you have a thermally broken frame with a dual pane um, and, a low, and a low E coating. However, you have to pick two of the uh, menu items below, a higher performance thermal break, 
uh, warm edge spacer, argon fill, and that second uh, low E um, coating on surface four. If you want to get to um, a 0.33 to 0.34, you've got to pick three of those um, options. And then if you want to get to 0.29 or below, you either have to have all four of those options or you go for a high performance frame and a triple pane. And then just to um, wrap up, the recommendations really mirror what Steve said earlier. Really specify the whole fenestration U factor and a condensation resistance performance. Make sure you do two. Focus on the frame and the edge first. And in the interest of time, I think I need to, to hand over to uh, Stefan. So let me, uh, if you want to take the helm, Stefan. Will do. Share my screen here. Okay, our kind of next topic, kind of uh, moving on from kind of the uh, glass and windows is talking about kind of mitigating the impact of thermal bridging at the interface with those systems and within the opaque wall assembly that focuses on the perimeter of the enclosure. So we'll talk about the implications of building envelope design on the path towards net zero and how kind of mitigating the thermal bridging is a big part of that. So the big implication that we're facing is moving from prescriptive based code to performance based ones and looking increasingly at better quantifying the performance of our enclosure systems. In the majority of the current energy code have a prescriptive based approach. You list out the system requirements with minimum U value requirements, you know, to satisfy some preconceived static broad notions for common construction practice. And often what these do is look at systems in isolation. You know, requirements for window U values, opaque wall values, your glazing ratio, your equipment efficiency, air tightness of the overall building. But each of those is looked at in isolation. Increasingly what we're seeing in terms of the development of energy code is we're going from these prescriptive based code to performance based codes where you now have absolute targets that the building has to meet. And that is driving you to have better accounting of the performance of the enclosure, including the calculation of thermal bridging. Example of some of these codes are the British Columbia Energy Step Code, uh, a code that's based on kind of predicting the requirements for compliance to the construction codes through 2030 in individual steps and where individual municipalities can incentivize developers to kind of <clears throat> build to a higher step in the NG code. Likewise, the City of Toronto Green Standard version 3 also has this kind of approach of absolute targets and kind of a focus on thermal bridging calculations. In the drive toward net zero, energy and codes. I always refer back to NREL's best practice for high performance buildings, which talks about designing the building envelope so it can be used to meet as many as the loads as possible. The envelope should be the first method of creating low energy buildings. The mechanical and lighting system can then be sized to meet the remaining loads. Low energy architecture is not gonna be effective if the mechanical systems have to solve problems that results from the envelope design. So with these drives to net zero performance and energy codes, absolute performance space is kind of increasingly being the floor, which drives kind of energy modeling, often backed up by monitoring of the completed buildings. What we've also seen is now you have a trend towards not only having an overall performance targets for the building, traditional EUI, but also specific performance targets. And I'll talk a little bit about the Teddy that looks at space conditioning energy. And in some venues like the city of Vancouver, looking at the greenhouse gas generated energy, all of which require comprehensive thermal bridging transmittance calculations. 
So I think most of us are familiar with the EUI, the energy use intensity metric that looks at the total energy per unit area of the building. It includes everything in the building that consumes energy. The new metric in some of these performance space code is the TEDI, the thermal energy demand intensity. It essentially looks at the total space conditioning load per unit area. So only the energies associated with conditioning the space, not kind of plug loads or hot water use or other energy demands that are important to monitor in the building, but don't really impact the design of the envelope and mechanical systems. So when faced with these more stringent codes, it is really important to look at strategies to optimize the envelope thermal performance. I'll go through a few of these before we go deeper into accounting for thermal bridging. The first aspect is to optimize the envelope surface area. The key concept here is the ratio of the envelope to the floor space is a driver for how much enclosure exposure you have. And likewise, minimizing the extent of interfaces can help reduce the impact of the thermal bridges. So if you have a very basic shape, you can see that kind of a teddy around 15.1 is kind of a feasible aspect. But as you have a more articulated building, the impact of thermal bridging becomes more significant. And you can see that a teddy score rises to 20. However, the ratio of wall area to uh, floor area is also important. Even if you have just a basic geometry and not a lot of thermal bridging, you can see that kind of the larger floor to ratio of the envelope means that your Teddy score is significantly higher. So looking at the massing of the building becomes an important aspect. A lot of the issues have to deal with optimizing the fenestration. The key concept there is that alignment of the glazing and the thermal barrier and the opaque wall is really key to minimizing thermal bridging. So if we're looking at these kind of four different kind of approach, all have the same area of glazing, the same area of opaque wall, the linear interface between those two can be significantly different. So in kind of a typical ribbon window approach, your interface length is about five meters. But if I go to an approach where my opaque and vertical glazing are kind of side by side, I've cut that down by almost half. And if I go to a punched window opening, you can see that I'm back to above the five meter length of the first example. If I have two smaller windows side by side, I've almost doubled that interface. And that has a big impact on the performance of the adjacent opaque walls because Thermal bridging at the interface with the window systems is one of the key areas of thermal bridging. So to continue to optimize our fenestration, the next concept is to optimize the glass to flame ratio using the larger glazing units. So you get your better performance of the glazing itself, but also optimize the glazing interface to minimize thermal bridging. So if my glazing system is not in line with the major thermal barrier in the opaque wall, I get a lot of heat loss at the interface through flanking paths. And so what we're showing here is that if you're looking to kind of improve your Teddy score, kind of getting a better system where your insulation and your glazing are properly aligned is really important. The next aspect is optimizing the performance of the opaque envelope itself. And the impact of thermal bridging is really key because poor interface details will really undermine the effectiveness of the increased insulation. In this graph here, we're showing that in this steel stud wall example, with no additional exterior insulation, I can improve the performance by doing better details that minimize thermal bridging. But that is kind of just a small percentage of that. If I look at this example here, the third one, where I've added R15 of continuous exterior insulation, 
it shows that its performance is not really better if I haven't accounted for thermal bridging than the example in which I just built with better framing details without the continuous insulations. However, if I do address those thermal bridges through the continuous insulation, then I can achieve really superior performance in the opaque wall. The impact of the interfaces is also really important. If we have in this example here on the right, a projecting slab, you can see that the additional heat loss is in the range of almost 0.5 BTU per hour per linear feet of slab edge. And if I move the assemblies in continuous insulation from the interior to the exterior of this mass wall, I'm actually improving its performance, not insignificantly. I'm going from almost 0.5 to about 0.34 BTUs per linear foot. And if I were to include a thermal break to separate the structural slab from the floor slab, I would really kind of reduce that amount down to kind of 0.12 BTU per linear foot of that interface. So kind of addressing these interface issues can have a big impact because you're gonna have a very highly efficient wall assembly and we'll see one in an example and work uh, for the group that that can have a significant impact on even the best performing opaque walls. The next aspects is to optimize the thermal performance of the envelope is to optimize the insulation performance of the assemblies by minimizing the thermal bridging at structural supports and interfaces. So looking at kind of a basic assembly, we would pick clear field values for those assemblies, you know, the spandrel assembly and the insulated wall assembly, and then kind of look at key interface details, your parapet detail, your window to opaque wall interface, your floor slab detail, and account for those as part of the performance. When you're looking to get the net zero ready, this is really challenging to do without high thermal details. And small differences in detailing can have a significant impact. And we've seen that how we've kind of evolved from the building envelope bridging guides, kind of initial valuation and categorization of details efficient as regular and poor to really kind of in the low Teddy guide, breaking that out even further to really play out the impact of these interfaces. Because when you're trying to aim for net zero, these are really important. And in particular, the wall to window interface demands the greatest attention because the potential for variation in these values has the biggest overall impact. The structural support is also a key one. Some are easy to address and some are kind of non-starters. A lot of the enclosure design has been based on kind of making things work structurally and then looking at how that can be improved by the use of thermal breaks and other means. However, increasingly, it's important to look at things as how I would design for thermal efficiency and then figure how to make that work structurally. In particular, cladding attachments with combustible components is kind of a key aspect. Thermal breaks in kind of framing systems, continue the thermal insulation across the structures and how the window is positioned outboard of the structure to align it with the insulation all have structural implications. So from a perspective of designing for thermal efficiency, it goes hand in hand with the structural aspects of the enclosure. The two kind of resources that I'll cover here today are the Building Envelope Thermal Bridging Guide uh, that comes out of the ASHRAE study, as well as the more recent Guide to Low Thermal Energy Demand for Large Building, published by BC Housing. I'll start with the latest one. The Low Teddy Guide is a, a publication that provides guidance to detail for net zero ready and passive house buildings. It focuses on part three buildings, and that's Canadian code jargon for non-combustible construction. And the details have been included in the next version of the Building Envelope Thermal Bridging Guide. It continues to build on that catalog of database, 
but it also talks a lot about the concepts that are required to build these net zero and passive house ready buildings. The building envelope thermal bridging guide itself started around uh, 2010 with a research project for ASHRAE. We looked at 3D software that can better model the impact of thermal bridging. We validated these models uh, with a large set of databases from 3D kind of hot box uh, systems. We borrowed a methodology from Europe and applied it to North American practice for accounting for linear transmittance, point transmittance. And we built up a catalog of initially 40 details that conveyed the thermal performance of the system accounting for thermal bridging. The thermal bridging guide was then kind of taken on by kind of BC Hydro. In additional details were done with less emphasis on meeting hard targets for assemblies and evaluating the performance as connected components, but not in parallel path. That's going to really where the key aspects comes in. And the traditional approach in code is this parallel pass where you look at the heat flow as individual components, but don't look at how one impacts the other. So you can see in this diagram that the impact of this balcony slab is not limited to the area of the slab, but also impacts the adjacent opaque walls above and below it. And so the additional heat loss from the slab kind of reduces the thermal performance of the opaque wall assembly above and below it. To account for those, the guide has developed a series of 3D models that look at the clear field value and then looks at quantifying the additional heat loss at interface. This is done by using this 3D software to accurately model a performance of a complex assembly and then contrasting it to one where we remove that particular linear transmittance or thermal bridge, in this case, the balcony slab. And when you compare these two models, you can get the impact in terms of the additional heat loss per linear foot of that balcony slab. And that allows you to quantify it in a way that can be better cataloged. And that's the concept of linear transmittance. So what you'll find is the guy has a number of assemblies that models the clear field value. That is the thermal performance of an assembly in absence of interfaces or transitions. And then modeling these linear and point uh, interfaces in those assemblies and defining what is the additional heat loss at those interfaces. So you have the concept of your clear field U values for the opaque wall and then additional linear transmittance and point transmittance to account for the additional heat loss at those interfaces. So in order to get the overall performance of the enclosure, you add those together. You start by doing your clear field transmittance for all of the assemblies. And then you go and look at the additional linear heat loss and point form transmittance that are happening throughout your building. And then you're able to account the additional heat loss that that adds to that assembly so that you can get a realistic thermal performance value for that particular assembly. The original thermal bridging guide was released in 2014. It is essentially broken down in three parts. Part one talks a little bit about the process that's used to analyze thermal bridging. Part two talks about the energy savings and the cost benefits analysis. And three is the significance insights and next steps. The current version, which was just released this August, significantly impacts on the catalog. It's the fourth release of this. I've posted the link to it in the chat group uh, for this presentation. It's 
correctly kind of outgrowing the PDF format and is now in the process of migrating to a web-based application with a number of how to use videos. The catalog is basically broken down into an appendix B, which has a visual summary of all the assemblies and rated by the impact of their thermal performance and the interfaces. Your appendix A typically shows you the individual assemblies with a kind of 3D diagram that shows the dimension of the systems used in the model, as well as all the materials and their properties that were used in the 3D model. <clears throat> that gives you an ability to compare it to proposed assemblies and see kind of where the differences are. And it gives you a good understanding of the areas and how it implies if you're looking at something that is different in terms of its surface area. The second part in Appendix B, the matching sheet, provides the performance values and transmittance types. It gives you a detailed description of those. There is a kind of thermal image that shows you the temperature index at the various surfaces of the assembly. It then provides you a legend with the individual values that are calculated. Typically the nominal U value and R value, the clear field U value and R value. And for interface assemblies, as you see here, the linear transmittances. So in this example here in the tables, you can see the base assembly, which is this spandrel panel. The assembly with the glazing element is shown as a separate element so that you have an understanding of the performance of the glazing systems that was used in this model. And then looking at the linear transmittances for this interfaces, uh, the additional heat that occurs between the vision glass and the spandrel area, and then the spandrel in isolation. Then the last is usually the thermal index that gives you a number of key points that are shown in this diagram where the temperature index is shown for a specific location to help you determine the potential risk of condensation given the temperatures for your specific project. So this is where we'll do a little bit of an audience exercise. We'll look at three assemblies from the thermal bridging guide. A basic kind of masonry veneer with exterior insulation and bat insulation in the steel stud cavity. Uh, the masonry veneer is tied back with kind of intermittent ties. And then we'll contrast that clear fuel value to an example where we have the additional heat loss of the linear transmittance of the shelf angle design. And then we'll look at a similar design where the detailing of the shelf angle is improved to help mitigate that. Um, the values are going to be shown in the poll section. So if you want to follow along and kind of uh, make your selections, we'll go from there. So here's the first example. This is the clear field value of the insulated masonry veneer. So essentially what you're seeing here is in the first two columns, you have the nominal value based on the amount of continuous insulation outboard of the steel stud assembly. And then you have the <clears throat> results that factor in the impact of the 3D heat loss. So for this one, what is the clear field R value of the effective assembly with R15 continuous insulation? I'll give you a few seconds to look at the charts and the answers in the poll and make your selection. So just a reminder to go to the poll, you have to go back to the Facade Tectonics World Congress Pathable page. And if you um, uh, click on the polls tab, you should, there should be, you should see at least three polls there. If you look at the top one, what's the clear field effective R value for this assembly with R15 continuous um, exterior uh, insulation. And if you hit the vote button, you can pick either A or B.
Okay, I'm seeing the uh, seeing the poll results come in. Okay, and I'll go ahead and present the answer. Okay. So you can see that the answer here for the R15 for the effective value, not the nominal value, is around 19.8 R value. Um, so we can see it's, just, it's still a significant derating of the insulation, but it accounts for the thermal bridging through the studs and the masonry ties. But it's still a really well insulated wall that would meet the prescriptive value in most climate zones under ASHRAE 90.1. So now if we then look at what happens at the floor line interface where I have the supporting steel lintel angle. In this assembly, the steel angle is installed tight to the slab and it interrupts the continuous insulation. So again, here, when you look at your thermal performance indicators, you have the 1D, which is your nominal value. You have the clear field values, which are the thermal performance of the wall away from the shelf angle. And then you have your U value that accounts for the additional heat loss, as well as the linear transmittance. So this next question focuses on the linear transmittance and asks, for the same R15 continuous insulation. What is the linear transmittance for the shelf angle? So everyone going to the poll? Okay, looks like we have participation in the poll. Okay, so unveiling the answer. Here, we can see that the answer is 0.314 BTUs per linear feet. So when that is factored into the clear field value, you can see that I've gone from the 19.8 that we had before down to 9.9 .9 in terms of an effective value that includes the additional heat loss at the floor slab. So you can see that this 0.34 BTUs per linear foot has a big impact on the performance of this opaque wall. It's cut it down by half. So you can see that, you know, a really small detail, just how I installed the shelf angle has a big impact. In our last example, we now have the shelf angle supported on intermittent anchors so that the continuous insulation can extend behind the shelf angle. So for this last example, what is the effective R value for this assembly? Again, with R15 continuous exterior insulation, including the linear transmittance of the shelf angle. So we're looking at the overall effective value factoring in the linear transmittance. Okay, so here the answer is A, it is 12.6. So we can see that by moving the <coughs> shelf angle outboard of the continuous insulation, I've gone from 9.9 .9 to 12.6 in terms of the overall performance. And if we look over here to the last column, the linear transmittance, we went from 0.314 BTUs per linear foot to 0.189. So we almost cut the additional heat loss at the linear transmittance by half. So small detailing uh, can really impact the thermal performance. And that's why it's really important to pay more attention to these as we look to get better performance out of our enclosure. 
So now go through kind of an exercise of saying how this applies to the overall performance of the enclosure. So you would start looking at a sample building and first identify the assemblies and their associated clear field values. So in this case, we have an opaque spandrel assembly in the curtain wall. We have the opaque masonry wall, and then we would have our roofing assembly. Those are the three major opaque wall assemblies that are part of this. The vision itself is kind of a third kind of view values, but it's accounted for based on NFRC methodology and the additional heat loss at those interfaces will be factored in this exercise. So the next step is to identify the thermal bridges at these interfaces. You know, in the clear feel of the wall, we've accounted for things like the steel studs and the point supported anchors. And we're really looking now at the interfaces. So what we see is we have a linear transmittance between the assembly where the curtain wall meets the masonry wall. We have a window to wall factor around the perimeter of the punched window opening in the brick masonry. We have a roof to wall interface detail to account for. We have the linear transmittance at the intermediate floor and then at the base of the building, the transition to the foundation. So those are the major interfaces that we have to account for. Then we need to do some quantity takeoffs. We need to figure out you know, how much linear trans, you know, conditions do we have for each of these areas. We need to calculate the kind of opaque areas of the masonry veneer and the spandrel and then the window area itself. Once we have those, we can start building our model. And this shows you that for a building with kind of a average shape, a kind of window glazing ratio of 0.4, a roof R value of R40, a U value for the window of 0.2, so a high performance triple glaze, looking at 0.3 from a solar heat gain coefficient, 80% uh, efficiency on our mechanical system, code level performance with regards to air leakage, and electrical heat source. If I'm trying to kind of get my Teddy score or my EUI score down, you see we still have a range of options on the performance of my assembly from you know, effective R16 to an effective R9. So if we are looking to be below 15, which is typically the target at the step four of the BC code, you can already tell that you know, I'm going to have to be at least above R11 in my effective value. So what we've looked at is your parapet. We can go from an R9.9 .9 to an R10 by increasing our <clears throat> performance at that interface. At the floor slab with the masonry veneer, we already have efficiency, so there's nothing else to be done there. If we align our, bed, our window better with the insulation, we can go from R10 to about R11. The corner condition with the continuous insulation is already efficient, so there's no change to be made there. When we look at our foundation, looking at how we place the insulation under the slab versus uh, lining it up with the insulation in the wall makes a difference there. I can go from R11 to R11.7. Looking at my balcony, if I have balcony interfaces in there, again, that can significantly impact the value. Uh, and if I go really to the high performance thermal break, I can get that opaque wall, the effective R13.1. And then I can go back to the wall and see if it makes sense to add additional insulation. So if I go from R15 to R25, I can go from about R15.2 to about R16. So you have to see, you know, is it worth that extra insulation? So the path forward, as I said, is going to become increasingly difficult to ignore the impact of thermal performance in the envelope assemblies. We're going to have to move beyond just simply adding more insulation to be able to better account for the thermal performance of the building enclosure. The envelope will play an increasingly important role in energy efficiency. We'll have to look to the building envelope to optimize our energy performance. Uh, shift our thinking from nominal R value to effective R values, then move beyond just adding insulation to efficiency through better details. 
we'll also need to be prepared to evaluate new products. And only when we truly account for thermal bridging can we see the impact that these new technologies can really have on the performance of our opaque wall. And that's it. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Very excited to be here. I'm going to ask Helen to wave your hand. I've had a little bit of a spotty sound voice every like once every five minutes. So if at some point you feel like you lost me for a little bit, just wave your hand and I'll repeat what I just said. Extremely excited to be here. Uh, fabulous uh, previous two panelists. And uh, I'm here to talk to you about what comes beyond energy when, we come, when it comes to window design and facade design. Um, I'm Alejandra Menchaca. I'm a vice president at Thornton Tomasetti, um, the sustainability practice. Thermal comfort. Uh, this is a survey uh, developed by the CBE uh, in Berkeley that basically evaluated uh, or asked almost 53,000 occupants, building occupants, what their satisfaction level was with respect to many factors in terms of building design and operations. And not surprisingly, sound privacy came down the worst, but temperature was the second worst. And I think many of you might relate to either the man at the bottom or the lady at the top, or either too cold or too hot in buildings so frequently. So the focus of today is how can we design a facade that does not contribute to this and actually improves um, a building occupant satisfaction. This is relevant because as for anyone who has been freezing or too hot in an office, as you all know, our performance actually decreases. And so if you actually compare how much money goes into as a tenant or as an owner, or um, how much money goes into actual utilities. So the impact of improving, say the U-value, all the things that we've been talking about with respect to the impact, the financial impact that you would have if you improved conditions that would improve uh, productivity, financially thinking about comfort is really the way to go. We want to improve productivity of occupants. Now, as we talk about comfort, I'm just gonna take a step back, uh, a quick step back at um, defining what comfort is, what thermal comfort is. We tend to think about thermal comfort, really just, we tend to think about, about it just being room temperature and sometimes relative humidity, right? And so if we're outside, sometimes we'll say, well, it's really hot and humid and that's why it feels uncomfortable. But in reality, there's six variables that are used to define comfort. Um, the four on the right are actually determined by building design. So as designers, we have control over them. The two on the left are actually determined by occupancy. So for occupancy, whether you are running or seating, of course, you're going to have different levels of comfort. You want a room that is a little cooler if you're running than if you're sitting. Likewise, if you're wearing a thick jacket versus shorts you might want different temperatures. Your level of comfort might be very different with respect to someone else. On the right, there's four variables that we can control. Air temperature, as I mentioned, and relative humidity are the two that we think of the most. Um, air speed, for anyone who has, in these very hot days, who has sat right next to a fan, you know that air speed automatically improves your comfort when it's too hot. It automatically decreases your comfort if it's too cold and it gets chilly. And finally, radiant temperature. Radiant temperature is what you feel when you're really close to a fire, right? To a fire pit or even just the sun, right? When you feel that heat without necessarily touching that air, that is what radiant temperature is. And what, as we'll see, I'll talk mostly about winter comfort today. Uh, when you're standing really close to a cold surface, you will actually feel uncomfortable even if the air temperature is at the right level. Now, thermal comfort is also defined by expectations by gender, by age, and by health, right? And so we all feel very differently, and I'm sure you've experienced this. Uh, sometimes we were expecting a store to be cooler than it actually is, so we feel uncomfortable. Uh, gender, as we know, is a big factor, as well as age and, uh, and health, as I mentioned. Thermal discomfort can happen in two ways. One of them is uh, in summertime, I mean, actually even in wintertime, direct sunlight on us can cause a fair amount of discomfort. So a lot of the times we talk about, you know, discomfort in the summertime due to direct sunlight, we need to lower the shades, we just need to design shading to protect from the summer sun. So there's a lot of research that actually proves that a lot of people feel extremely uncomfortable in the wintertime when they're in the sun. 
not me, <laughs> but uh, a lot of people feel. And so very important to keep that in mind. And then in the winter time when there is no sun, we feel uncomfortable when we're really close to a window that is either drafty or that has a surface temperature that is very low. So today we'll be focusing on this aspect of thermal comfort. And I'll give you a few tools and references on how to address summer, summer comfort or at discomfort associated to direct sunlight, which is fairly easy to model. But today we'll be focusing on winter comfort. Why do we care about winter comfort? Well, while mechanical systems are there to keep us comfortable regardless of what facade we design for, um, it is very important to keep in mind that if we design a facade correctly, we don't need to implement, in most cases, we don't need to use perimeter heating. And perimeter heating for anyone who has used it means a loss of valuable square footage. Just look at this image, right? And many of you are familiar with this, even in your homes, right? Um, additional system, it means an additional system to install and maintain, so it's first cost. And a lot of studies have actually proven that better performance, improving in better windows, oftentimes outweighs the cost of, um, of uh, you know, it, it, it equates to the savings. You, you achieve more savings by in, in investing on a high performance facade than by paying for perimeter heating. And also degraded window performance. Uh, my colleagues have been talking a lot about window performance, so I'm grateful for that. But think about that perimeter heating actually warming up. You're effectively putting like an electric resistance on your window, you're wasting energy by doing that. Your window performance is actually degraded. Your U-value is gonna be much worse if you have perimeter heating. So let's talk about how we design to minimize that winter discomfort. There are two aspects of comfort that are covered uh, by this, this feeling of cold close, to a cold close to a poor performing window. One of them is radiant discomfort, as I mentioned, is just the temperature of the surface of the glass um, is low. The other one is that cold draft that falls down a window is a cascade of cold air that falls down to the floor or sometimes of your desk. If anyone, like I did in grad school, if any of you have had your desks against a glass and in the wintertime, you'll feel that cold draft on your hand, right? And so that's the downdraft discomfort. Um, these two types of discomfort are associated, directly associated to the U value of the glass. So a worse U value, a worse performing window will lead to increased radiant and downdraft discomfort, as well as the exterior design temperature. So of course, if we're talking about San Francisco, this is not gonna be, even if you have single pane glass, it's not gonna be as much of an issue as you, if you are in Boston or say Alaska, right? Uh, window dimensions matter a lot. So how tall the window is extremely critical for that, for that downdraft discomfort. So think of that, cold cascade of cold air that falls along the windows. The longer that cold surface is, the more cold air you're gonna have. Mullion projections are also important. The more mullion projections you have, the more you break the downdraft. Now, as my colleagues mentioned previously, mullions are not great. Too much frame is not great for many things. So I would not recommend using mullions to break the downdraft. And then finally, something that's called view factor. And just understand view factor as how much of your body sees that cold surface. So if you feel as uncomfortable as if you're really cold, close. Helen, you feel like you lost me for a little bit? Yeah, just uh, uh, you came back, so you, we're good. Perfect. So as I was mentioning, view, window view factor, view factor is really how much of our body sees that cold surface. The closest we are to it, the more, the colder we will feel. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna teach you today how to use a really cool, freely available online tool that I helped develop when in my past days when I used to work as a building scientist at Payette uh, called the Glazing and Winter Comfort Tool. And I wanna walk you a little bit through the interface, but we're gonna do a little exercise. Um, this is a, as I mentioned, online tool that's super simple to use and can help you define whether you need perimeter heating or not, or how to help your mechanical engineer. In, in, in trying to eliminate perimeter heating. Um, the first thing I'll point out of the interface is that there is an area right here to define the facade geometry. So defining the room, like is how tall is the ceiling? How long, how wide is the room? Sill dimensions, et cetera, how, how much glass there is. And it is reflected, whatever you enter is actually reflected in this little graphic on the top left, on the top left, that's correct. And you can compare three cases, you'll see that in a little bit. The second, 
area that I'll show you is the results. What you want to look at is anything above that black line is not good. It's uncomfortable. Anything below it is comfortable. And what you see in the x-axis is distance from the facade. So how far away am I from the facade? So sure enough, if I'm really far away from a window, I'm going to be comfortable, right? But as, as I get close to that window, then I become uncomfortable. So those are things to keep in mind. Uh, the dotted line here indicates what distance from the facade you actually picked, but the graph actually tells you how you perform at different distances from the facade. As I mentioned, outdoor design condition matters. And so if you are in a city or a place where the design condition is say zero degrees Fahrenheit, so your worst possible outdoor temperature, you're gonna be more constrained in terms of what you can do to eliminate perimeter heating than if you're in an area that is a little bit more flexible. And then finally, facade performance, right? That is, these are the two things we wanna design for. Facade geometry, is there anything we can do about the geometry, the dimensions of the windows to make the space more comfortable? But also, is there anything we can do about our U value to improve that comfort? Uh, what you'll notice here, there's window U value, and uh, I appreciate my, pan my, my uh, fellow panelists going really deep into what U value is and assembly U value is. I would recommend as a conservative estimate to use here the assembly U value unless you have a lot of glass in very little frame, at which point you're getting closer to a center of glass U value. And the tool actually tells you what U value you need to meet a comfortable level at the distance that you specified. So at three feet from the facade, you for this particular scenario, you would need to have a 0.29 U value in order to meet this. And there's indoor conditions, there's a lot of other more advanced, uh, more advanced inputs that I won't go through. So what I want to go through right now is, this is the link and let me just pause for a second because you'll notice you can Google the tool online, but they have recently changed the website and the setup is a little weird and I really, really, really like the original uh, setup, and so I'm going to give you the back, you know, the back door to the tool, um, as opposed to the front door, but you can use the front door too. And so I am going to, I think I can do this, so I can just copy this link here and share it in the right here. Right, uh, okay, I'm going to need Helen to help me. How do I go back? Meeting manage, is it manage? Oh no, chat, sorry, chat, 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 right here. Oh, join meeting, Hey. No, no, you just go to chat and you should be, you should be able to put it let in. Let me go back, All right, let me go back here. Okay, chat, there we go. Oh, Nick, awesome. How did you find it? Did you just Google it? That's awesome, thank you so much, Nick. Um, that's perfect, I'm glad to know that it's easily Googleable. Uh, all right. So here it is. So that's the link. And what we're going to do is do a little exercise. Okay. And I should, I just want to go, before you go into it, let me just do a little bit live, of a live demo. And then we're going to do the exercise. So this is what that link looks like. And I'm going to click on accept here. And the first thing I'm going to ask you to do, and you can do for anyone who's on a laptop like me, you might not be able to see two screens. So just focus on this one for a little bit, and then we'll do the exercise. I really like the results in the combined graph. So the only thing I'm asking you to do is just as soon as you're in, just go to the combined graph and that will tell you automatically whether you're comfortable or not. And you'll see here, I'll try to change, say my window width. And so if I start changing the window width, you'll notice that the dimensions actually change. Uh, now I just, yeah. Um, then uh, let me see, except uh, here. You can change, as I mentioned, the temperature, design temperature, et cetera. And then you can go on and add another case, for instance, and say, well, what if I lower the U value here? Look, my comfort curve is getting much better, right? If I want everyone to be comfortable in the room, I'm gonna need a U value of 0.16. And then, well, what, what if I pick that, but I actually make it larger? And I'm not gonna give too much away because this is our exercise. So I'm just gonna leave it at that. Uh, so again, we're gonna do a little exercise. And what I'm going to ask you to do is you're going to find a facade geometry. So first focus on the geometry, not on the U value, because U value is easy for us to just come up with a number, but it actually, you know, budget is, you know, we don't want to get to the point where U value drives everything. So find a facade geometry that allows you to eliminate perimeter heating at two feet from the facade for the default climate on the website. 
And the things that I'm going to ask you to look at is which facade geometry variable has the most impact on comfort and the least impact on comfort. So don't play with any of the other variables, just play with those two. And you can add cases, and so that's gonna make it easier for you to track. And then the second one is, which design would eliminate perimeter heating by either using, is it, is it by using double pane glass or by triple pane glass? And so try to find a design, basically what I'm asking you to do is find a design that allows you to use double pane glass, and here I just picked a number of 0.3, we could spend a long time defining whether that makes it or not, but just pick 0.3 as double pane. Um, and try to identify, is there any design that you can come up with that, that, that meets that, or do you need to go to triple pane glass? And so if you end up with triple pane glass, what can you do? And so we're gonna take maybe four minutes uh, and, and uh, just go on your computers and do it. And if you have any questions, just feel free to unmute and ask questions. I think. Any questions, um, I'll have it here live. So any questions you might have, I think are gonna help everyone else learn how to use the tool. And to be clear, I don't have a poll after this. So this is mostly for you to learn and discuss which variables have the most impact. And if you can use the chat, then I guess you can type it on the chat later. Alejandra, while people are yes. uh, doing that, a question I've, as I've used, the, tried to use this before without the benefit yeah your um, uh, expertise. Um, mm -hmm. With the graph, um, is the PPD including both downdraft and mm -hmm. mean radiant temperature, or is it just one or the other? That's a great question. So that's the reason why I like it combined instead of, of and, and you're actually making a great point. Thank you for, the split graph actually looks at both of them separate. So the top one looks at downdraft and the bottom one looks at radiant. What we found, we, we spend uh, two years doing research on this topic. Um, and what we found was that radiant discomfort is effectively never an issue. <laughs> that downdraft discomfort is a meeting issue. Um, and so what basically these two charts try to tell you is that if you found yourself in the very unusual scenario where downdraft discomfort is not an issue, so it's all in white, but radiant discomfort is actually exceeding the line, you would be able to see it there. We did code it in the combine. You see little circles and little triangles. Basically, triangles tell you this is downdraft dominated versus circles tell you it's, it's radiant dominated. Ah. Um, yeah. So it's, you're always going to see what, what are going to drive. Um, any questions? Anyone who's using it and who has questions, thoughts? Don't be shy. This is your chance. Are you going to show them um, how you would have approached that um, exercise? I would be happy to do it. I think we're, we're going to do maybe one more minute and then we're going to go and we're going to do a little bit of the exercise. I actually did a little bit already, but we'll, we'll start off right here. Um, the website also has this little tab right here called Understanding Discomfort that has a reminder of the three the, the things that matter for downdraft and uh we wrote a fair amount of research papers on it so you should be able to find them somewhere i think in the references here um there is a mention also to condensation is there a risk for condensation so this take it very lightly because as my panelists already explained the frame is actually your driving factor for condensation um, we included this just because there's a particular type of glass that has a low E coating on the rim side. So on surface four, if it's double pane glass, that is very prone to condensation. It's amazing in terms of thermal performance, but it's very prone to condensation. So we actually included that because we were doing that in a project. All right, so I think we're close to the four minutes. So I'm gonna go through this exercise super quick and then just show you there's really no right answer to come up with a design, right? There's many ways to coming up with it, but let's just look at this. So we currently have, we're in a climate where the, out, the outside temperature is 10 degrees Fahrenheit. That's our design temperature. And we have punched windows that actually look pretty good. Um, if we wanted to reduce comfort, to, to improve thermal comfort without changing the glass yet, one thought would be, well, Ale said that really tall windows actually have an impact, right? And, and so can we maybe make the windows a little shorter? And you'll see 
da, right? Now, of course, you don't want to do this. Like there's, there's design involved in this, but understanding that window height matters really can make you decide in design to that. And so what we typically do in projects, we actually do this evaluation in concept design where there are no windows in the building. And we will tell our client, this is the threshold or the architect. If you design to windows that are up to six and a half feet for Boston, I think it's six and a half or seven feet tall. If you design for windows that are up to seven feet tall, you can actually get rid of perimeter heating with double pane glass. It's six and a half. Um, if you don't, then um, then you know then you're gonna you're you're gonna be in more trouble. Uh, then of course it depends if you're if you're working in a space type. If you are say if this is a corridor, then do you care that much about the first two feet? Maybe not. If this is an office, you care a lot about you know for tenants. When we work with developers, they they want to see the results at one foot from 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 the facade. So your variables change a lot. So let me. I wish I had. I'm just gonna reset this. And so we're gonna do three scenarios. Uh, so here's the first scenario is a default one. And so we'll say, well, my case two will actually have shorter windows there uh, and maybe wider because I want to keep the same amount of glass, right? But so I want to make them wider. Uh, and you'll see my comfort does not decrease. So I want to make them wider, but I'm going to make them a little shorter. Um, now, with the U value I have, that's really not kind of it. Now, to be fair, we said it's either going to be 0.3 or 0.2. So I'm going to start off by being at 0.3 in both. And you'll realize that for 0.3, the original one was almost there, right? So maybe here, I might even be able to go a little higher in terms of my window height and still get a fair amount of, of good daylight. If you get really deep into the, 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 the details and you actually have power of deciding where people are sitting, the tool actually allows you to see what the comfort will be if you're if the people are actually standing close to the wall versus the window. And then finally, the question is, well, what can I do from a U-value standpoint? And the answer is, if you are three feet away from the glass, you need a U-value of 0.28. Um, now, if I am closer to the glass, then my U-value is closer to 0.17. So you're going to have to meet it with triple pane glass and very, very sophisticated frames. Again, I'll just repeat, if, you, if your scenario is not frame intensive, then using a U value that is closer to the center of glass is fair to do. If you have windows that are very frame intensive, you will want to be closer. Uh, my good friend who's a mechanical engineer, Jacob Knowles, um, who, with whom we've worked on this to eliminate perimeter heating in, in, in many ways, uh, he, his rule of thumb is I'll just be, as a mechanical engineer, I'll be conservative and I'll use assembly U value unless you convince me otherwise. And so for windows, we work really hard to ensure that frame is really not that, that relevant, that prevalent. Um, as I mentioned, there's a bunch of other options that you can play with. Uh, room side low coating, as I mentioned, is, is, is a particular window type that is very unique. And there's other values here, as I mentioned, clothing, metabolic rate. So if people are running, then the comfort levels are gonna be different. So that's what it is. You can save a PDF, you can share the URL, you can, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to go back to um, sharing. So, so far, I really only talked about, so this is, I'm getting to very close to the end. Um, so we, we did this, we regrouped, but given the interest of time, we'll just, you know, you've seen me use it. Um, Winter comfort is just one piece, right? For anyone who lives in Texas or in California who designs in Texas and California, um, you'll know that when in the summer, uh, the CBE has, for any one of you familiar with a comfort tool, the CBE comfort tool, if you don't know it, it is so simple to use and it will really, really help you understand comfort. It actually has an option for direct sun. And so you can very easily appreciate whether there's direct, direct sun is going to cause this comfort. I can tell you based on my experience, direct sun, unless you're in Alaska or really far away where the sun angles are very low, direct sunlight leads to thermal discomfort. And so you need to cool even in the wintertime. Very, very, very unfortunate. Um, 
other very cool and useful comfort tools by the CBE. There's a CBE fan tool if you want to look at how much increasing the airspeed impacts comfort. This is not facade related. And then the thermal comfort tool, this is a radiant tool that is also extremely useful if you're just interested on the radiant component. And this is particularly useful in the summertime as well. Here you can actually model the sun. So, um, so that. And with that, these are my takeaways. The first one is Designing for acceptable thermal comfort is key to a pleasant and highly productive environment. From a money standpoint, that's where you want to put your money. Second, window design, dimensions, and performance can help improve comfort conditions by redu and reduce first cost if we are able to eliminate perimeter heating. And then finally, there are many very simple and free online tools to evaluate comfort conditions, both in summer and in winter. And with that, I'm open to questions. Thank you, Alejandra. That was great. Um, so just in terms of, of time, we're coming up to two o'clock, but we don't get our Zoom meeting doesn't get cut down, um, shut down for another 10 minutes. So um, as long as uh, my fellow panelists are available, we'll be around, we'll stay around to continue the conversations for another 10 minutes. So um, open the floor up to questions, especially to Alejandra and Stefan, who, um, who didn't get questions earlier. I have a question for you, Alejandra. Um, going back to the um, thermal comfort tool, um, you you said use the U center of the glass U factory if you had a lot of glass and less frame. One of the things I noticed though is if you happen to be sitting next to a window and the the sill height is kind of waist high or head high or you know somewhere around your body. Should you really be using the full um, U factor of the assembly because the mean radiant temperature at that point is probably uneven, and if the frame is a lot colder than the center of glass, yeah, how does that play into it. That's 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 actually an excellent question, and um, there's two things. So technically, if your frame is metal, metal doesn't really emit uh, its emissivity is extremely low. So from a radiant comfort discomfort standpoint, a horizontal metal element is really not impacting your radiant discomfort. It's the downdraft. And as I mentioned, it really, we tried the coldest surfaces and it was always a downdraft that dominated. And so it's really the downdraft that's going to be dominating. Now, if you have a lot of, I'm going to put the, the other example, let's assume you decide, well, I'm going to put my frame really far away from occupants, right? But I'm going to put tons of mullions. The mullions are so cold that they will enhance if they're not, not super prominent and so they don't break the downdraft, they'll actually make the downdraft worse. Uh, but to your question in specific, I would not say that being close to a frame would necessarily change to a very small amount of frame would necessarily change things. My main concern tends to be frame vertical frame intensive windows that are vertical because that cold surfaces are actually going to create much more downdraft than because they're much colder than the glass itself. So horizontal frame elements, not that much of a concern, I would say. But being conservative is always good. I'll just say that. Uh, and so center of glass, I would say we rarely use it unless we, it's a fully glazed facade that is really tall, at which point we know we'll need perimeter heating anyway. Any questions from the, uh, um, for the attendees? Yes. I, I might have a question, please. Oh, absolutely, go ahead. So, yeah, yeah. so uh, regarding thermal bridge, uh, I'm a little bit confusing about the usual commercial softwares that we use for energy simulations and for uh, thermal comfort simulations, uh, such as Zen Build or ISVE that, uh, or Energy Plus or whatever. So I think that most of the time when we calculate uh, the thermal calc or we do thermal calculations, we usually, uh, the software usually have a factor for thermal bridge. And I think this is not like uh, effective when we are talking about thermal, uh, thermal bridge calculations, uh, especially if we are uh, considering the effective uh, R value. So how do we usually uh, calculate or simulate the impact of different designs on the performance uh, of the building or uh, for the whole comfort of the space. 
I, I hope my question is clear. I think it is. <clears throat> what you're saying is that in the typical whole building energy simulation programs, Energy Plus or otherwise, you have the ability to put in your values and then arbitrarily derate them. Uh, <clears throat> and that's kind of accounting for the fact that the mechanical engineers know that although I have a certain performance in my wall, I, I'm not really getting that. And so it's the safety factor that gets kind of applied. So if you are using the values from the thermal bridging guide and you have a high degree of confidence that your effective value that you're putting into the energy model for your enclosure are the effective U values or R values, then you don't need to apply that extra safety factors and, and further derate them. Does that make sense, Mahmoud? Yeah, but I think most of the time, uh, this, this, this kind of factor I have no control of. It's just like in the software itself. Okay. Uh, well, have, I, have you encountered such problem? I know that we've been able to get around that in Energy Plus. Uh, and, you know, I'm not someone who does a whole lot of the whole building energy simulations myself, but I could put you in touch with one of my colleagues and they can tell you how they've been able to integrate these effective R values, U values into whole building energy simulation software. Yeah, Stefan, I'll add a lot to that, although I don't do the full building energy modeling myself either. Um, that's part of what my group does. And one of the things, one of the thoughts that I would have is you could potentially, if you know, I mean, there's documentation for Energy Plus that would effectively tell you, or for IES, right? So you actually know by how much they're being berated, even though you can't change it. So you could just basically calculate and so re-rate them and then re-derate them. So just calculate, figure out what gives you the the R value that you actually want, um, if if that is if 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 that is of of relevance um, there, I I would say, and Stefan, you probably agree with me in that the detailing requires a lot of effort, and the impact you can have on detailing is huge, and so having spending a lot of time on very careful detailing of specific details so your your full building energy model won't know that you have a slab you know a protruding, a protruding slab every so often right it won't it won't necessarily know that right and so understanding yourself so by doing say therm uh, a therm analysis on the side and understanding what the impact is of each of your specific of, of the thermal bridges in your actual building will allow you to start off from the right foot so that the degradation from the full building is so that so that you're more or less in line with the degradation of the full building energy model and not and not much worse it's it, it would require i think throughout it would require a little bit of hacking yeah yeah i guess yeah thank you so much um i have a question for steven primarily um but uh, I hope other people want to chime in would be great uh, about double skin facade or other uh, solution for an articulated envelope, but not necessarily overlap with the thermal envelope of the building. So perhaps we can design the thermal envelope in a more uniform way to eliminate uh, unnecessary thermal bridging, but still have it beautiful design that's articulated. Um, do, do you think that's something um, as consultant you can um, help the architect approach in a more progressive method? I'll answer. I'm, I'm not sure if you're addressing me or kind of uh, Steve uh, from Wausau, but we have done a number of double skin facade designs and kind of looking at kind of which of the elements within that provide the best kind of thermal isolation and mm -hmm. whether the exterior skin is one that's primarily there to address solar heat gain or shading. Uh, you know, those are all things that can be accounted for. And then you look at how you're ventilating the space between the two elements and you know whether you're going with a traditional ventilated double glazed facade or the trend to the more compact closed cavity facades 
and kind of assessing its impact from condensation resistance as well. Uh, those are all things that you know can be modeled in kind of the sophisticated analytics that are available today. Steve, did you have anything to add? Um, in 1980, where were you in 1980? Um, I was working on a double skin facade in Niagara Falls, New York with Canon Design from Buffalo. It was at that time the Hooker Chemical Building of Love Canal fame. It later became Occidental Petroleum Building and I believe it's currently sitting empty. Um, that double wall design had uh, condensation problems in that cavity from day one. And if I learned anything from that experience, it's uh, condition the air in the cavity. That uh, building relied solely on motorized dampers and blinds and free convection up the height of the building. It was maybe 10 or 12 stories. And uh, uh, a valuable lesson early in my career, um, Mother Nature is an unpredictable uh, source of conditioning of air, especially uh, six blocks from Niagara Falls, which throws a lot of humidity up into the air in the middle of the winter. So um, uh, that would be my advice for double skin is uh, a great idea acoustically, uh, almost too quiet. Uh, heat loss, great deal, great opportunity for rejecting solar heat gain before it gets on the inside, but be darn careful about condensation in that cavity and uh, make sure you have a mechanical solution in addition to a uh, naturally ventilated solution. Thank you. I'll add to that that I just happen to be located at this moment in uh, six time zones ahead of Eastern, so I'm in Europe, and I have had a chance to walk around a fair amount and see so many double skins facades around here. And it makes me wonder how come can they make it in every single building? <laughs> and we're still trying to implement it in very few select buildings. And so I think that there's a lot to learn um, on, on how it's done elsewhere. As a person that sells building skins for a living, I couldn't be more supportive of putting two on every building. <laughs> But Alejandro, would you say that the the reason that there aren't more double skins in the U.S. has um, more, has a lot to do with with our first cost focus, or is it yeah. technology limitation? I think I think that in my conversations, and I feel that about half of my projects discuss double skins facades at the beginning. In my experience, there is first cost for sure. Um, there is uh, also the concerns about moving parts, right? So activated, you know, and so if you're going to have your shades that are motorized, how is that going to work, etc. And and I, my, I don't, I don't have an answer for it, but I can say that right now I'm living in a building that has had motorized shades for 50 years. And when I tell people that in the U.S. we're worried about the thing breaking the first year, they're like, "What are you talking about now?" This is not a climate that gets, you know, I, I, I'm based in Boston, and so it's not Boston, right? We don't get, there's no snowmageddons and things like that in Toulouse, but uh, it's, it's, it, it, does, it is a little bit refreshing just to see how there's certain technologies that here have been used for, for 50 years and where there is a market, going back to your point, Helen, there is a market and so it's understood, like this is a place where double pane glass is more expensive than triple pane glass, right? Because the market is just triple pane. Uh, there is, it's just more affordable and so it's easier to have those conversations, it's easier to design. People have much more experience to Steve's point, right? Mechanical engineers know how, like they, they, they just know, the architects know, like there's much more collective experience on this type of facade that makes it less scary uh, than, than in the US. The U.S. is also very litigious, so I think a big factor plays there too. Another factor, especially in kind of dense urban cores, is the perceived loss of additional square footage. And that's why people are increasingly kind of looking at the concept of these kind of compact uh, seal double glazed facades 
rather than kind of the traditional yeah. larger ones, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And there are cities that will give you credit. So in yep. New York, if you have a double skin facade, you actually get credit for taking over more space. I see that we're um, coming up to actually almost 2.15. And so I think we are going to be um, uh, automatically ended soon. So um, thank you for those um, of you still um, uh, in attendance and um, really appreciate the, um, your time today. If you need um, any, if you have any more questions that you would really like to have answered, you can get hold of all four of us through the, um, the conference platform, um, or you can um, email me at helen.sanders at techniform.com and I will put you in contact with um, whoever you need to, um, to speak with. So um, again, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, just uh, drop us an email or message us through the platform. Bye. Thank Thanks you. Everybody. Thank you.